So yeah, my name's Ken Laporte. Uh, I'm the team lead at Bloomberg uh, in the search infrastructure department. Um, and kind of going to talk about how we monitor solar and, and what kind of actions we take and, and basically our general philosophy as well as some of the software around it. So the question that I have is, um, has this sort of thing happened to you? So you get a call in the middle of the night. Uh, this happened to Antrim just last week, I know. Um, two o'clock in the morning, you get woken up, you're like, what's going on? Um, side note, that is not the Bloomberg number. Um, did a little Photoshop editing there, so don't try and call that. Um, so you get woken up, they say, hey, there's a problem. You log on, middle of the night, you work for the next two hours, you figure out the problem, you roll it back, everything is going great. Um, and then you're looking at the clock like, if I go to sleep now, I'll get 30 minutes of sleep. Uh, you wake up, the, you get a, to work the next day, you're feeling terrible. Um, it's just a bad scene, right? So we're going to talk about how to fix some of that stuff, how to make that, that world a little bit better for you. Um, and we're going to do that by uh, talking about different strategies that we employ, uh, how we visualize our data, what's the monitoring and alarming that we do, uh, the backend architecture, and some future work that we have going on. Before I start, though, I want to talk about what a Bloomberg is, because especially for Berlin, uh, a lot of people don't, have never even heard of one. So the, the main product is the Bloomberg Terminal. It is, uh, Bloomberg is the world's largest provider of financial news and information. Um, providing that, in, that data as quickly and accurately as possible is key to our, to our use cases and to our, to our customers. Uh, but it goes beyond that. It goes to the financial markets as a whole. Um, there's a great story that I want to tell, but uh, uh, my friends from Amazon, I don't see you guys here today, so that, that's kind of good. Um, in June 2008, Amazon went down for a couple hours, uh, and it was estimated that they were losing $31,000 million, uh, $31, for every minute that they were down, which is just an insane amount of money. Three years prior, Bloomberg also went down. Bloomberg went down for a few, uh, I think it was a total of two hours. Um, and because of that, the Bank of England had to postpone a bond sale worth $3 billion. So the entire financial markets move on this. Um, and I kind of like a little demonstration of like how people felt. Um, there was also one great one about like, hey, Bloomberg's down, let's go to the pub. But I, I didn't know if that was appropriate for here. So bringing it back to solar. Uh, what do we do? So the search inf infrastructure team provides uh, search as a service to the rest of the company. We have a diverse uh, set of use cases, everything from geospatial search to text search. Uh, there was a talk in here just before about multi-language search. We do a ton of that. Um, we also do, obviously, financial data. Uh, everything from analytics of that financial data, uh, bonds, equities, all that stuff that I actually don't understand a thing of. Um, and I throw up some numbers here. This, these numbers are here just to give you a sense of the scale, the footprint that we're monitoring. Um, and to, to kind of say, with all of this, we really do have to have a serious amount of uh, orchestration around this so that when something goes wrong, we know about it, we can react. Um, and what about our team? What does our team do? So throughout Bloomberg, there's multiple uh, teams involved with search, uh, most notably our team, there's a new search team that does terrific work. Uh, you might know Christine from that team and Daniel Collins and Rom. Um, they do terrific work. Uh, Dennis Gove was on this team for a little while, one of the uh, solar committers and PMC member. Um, so all told, we have three committers, um, two people on the PMC, and we've made major contributions to solar in the last few years, uh, basically in every version since uh, for two, I think we've had some changes. Uh, a lot of it's bug fixes, but we've had some major contributions too. So for example, Dennis created uh, with the fo fine folks at Alfresco, like Mike uh, and Joel, the uh, streaming expressions component. Um, we also, from our, our um, discovery team, we created uh, the learning to rank component, which has been really successful uh, so far. Uh, in fact, I think that's, e that's even been moved over to Elasticsearch, and we use it in production uh, to the tune of, I think it's like 30,000 queries a second. 
So really very heavily used. Um, and Houston, who was here just a minute ago but had to step out, uh, he created an analytics component so that you can do Spark-like aggregations within solar. Um, so should your data exist in both, you can push all that, push all that down. Um, all this to say is that we are major believers in not only solar, but also open source. Um, we're trying to really like um, advocate for that at Bloomberg, and so far we've been very successful. All right. So just a quick review of some of the terms that we're going to be talking about. So solar cloud, I think everyone's pretty familiar with that. It's basically a cluster that it provides high availability and fault tolerance. Each cloud may be made up of multiple collections. A collection is just a complete logical index. Um, some clouds might have one index, uh, sorry, some clouds might have one collection, some clouds might have many. We run in very different scenarios there. That, that collection might be broken down to multiple shards. Each shard is just a logical piece of the index. Simple enough. Um, and then for each of those shards, you might have replicas or many replicas. Um, for each replica, you have to have a leader, and that leader is responsible to make sure that indexing happens. Should that leader go away, your, your ability to index new data uh, becomes a problem. We're going to talk some, some more about that later. Some other key terms, Zookeeper. Uh, Zookeeper is a consensus management system that Solar heavily relies on. Um, we use it internally also as offering that as a, consent as a leader election uh, service to our users, and for distributed configuration management. Um, so throughout this talk, I'll also mention how we monitor that because there's a lot of parallels between the two. Finally, service provider. That's me. That's the guy who's offering the search as a service. Um, our tenants, I think Anshin put it really well yesterday, uh, they're our hostile users. They're the, thing, they're the guys who um, have business use cases that they're trying to solve. They're trying to address a business problem without necessarily having to uh, fight against the functionality of the platform that exists. Um, I'm, ju I'm just kidding. We actually love our users. Uh, they really do push us, and, and I think they make our platform better. Uh, they make solar better. Um, so we're going to obviously talk about monitoring, but the alarming is also critical. Like, when something happens, how do, you get, how do you get notified, how do you get involved, and how, uh, how do you finally come to a resolution? So what does it mean to actually monitor solar? Um, uh, this is a common question that we were getting when we were discussing, like how, giving this talk, and a number of people were like, well, why not just use metrics? Why not just use Prometheus metrics, uh, JMX metrics, and figure out, like, can you figure out the state of solar from that? Can you figure out how it's performing, if everything's the problem, if anything's a problem, and then go from there? Um, what we've learned over time, and we have some Jira issues about this, is that metrics can lie. They can tell you things are fine when they're not. They can tell you things are broken when you might just be in a degraded state. You might be completely fine. So we realize that metrics are not just one measure that we can rely on. So instead, we said, OK, we're going to measure live nodes. Really, most simply, is solar running? And is it connected to ZooKeeper? Um, so when solar, I think most of you guys know, but when solar starts up, it makes a connection to ZooKeeper and says, I am here. Um, should that solar instance go away, that connection will time out, and that node will, will disappear from ZooKeeper. So we, we actually watch this and say, is that node there? Is it where, where I expect it to be? We also use cluster state or now state.json for monitoring. This gives us a ton of information like, you know, what does solar think its current state is? Not necessarily what it is, but what does it think it is? Um, it tells us what's running where. Um, sometimes the infrastructure such as ours, um, we, we have a very declarative view on solar. We know what should be running where, and this helps us determine if there's a difference between what is running versus what should be running and we can alarm and monitor off of that. Um, and finally, is there a leader for each, uh, for each shard? Um, obviously, very critical. Um, we do a lot of indexing. Um, if, if we don't have leadership, we are really going to have a problem. So getting back to that metric stuff, we do also monitor metrics. We want to know, like, is it performing? Is everything operating the way it should? 
Um, we, look at, we look at GC a lot. Whenever there's a problem, um, that's one of the first places that we turn to. Um, that was also mentioned in Anthem's talk yesterday. And, uh, a little shout out, there's a company called Tier 1 App that produces something called GC Easy. We've been using that for a little while to kind of ana analyze our GC logs. And it's been able to point out some problems and ways to reconfigure solar, uh, how we run it, that have made major differences in stability of some collections. Um, finally, we do s basic log analysis. We're looking at our logs saying, hey, do we see a problem here? Um, are we seeing this error? Are we seeing a lot of these errors? Um, and then responding to that. And finally, um, like any good service provider, we have a middleware. We typically don't let users connect directly to solar. Um, so this middleware does everything from like, hey, let me do a health check ping. Let me make sure everything is working. Um, and obviously, if our middleware that our users are trying to connect to can't connect to solar, that's just as big of a problem for us. Even if solar is in a healthy state, if there's some network disconnect between the two, we have a broken system. Um, and finally, another shout out to Antrim. Um, some of the work that he's going to do to, or release, I should say, in terms of like um, capturing uh, bad user, uh, we'll call it behavior, where they have too many documents going uh, too high off of scale and whatnot. If, um, those are going to go to logs and we'll add rules for our log analysis. So I, all this is to say, as new features to, are added to Solar, we can then integrate those features into our own monitoring stack. Zookeeper, Zookeeper is pretty much the same thing. So Zookeeper has a simple, are you okay four letter command? Uh, question, do you guys know what the four letter commands are? One person, awesome. <laughs> Um, so one of the main ways uh, up till 3.5 of monitoring Zookeeper was issuing four-letter commands. Uh, these are simple things that, uh, it's a simple text interface that says, you send it, are you okay? And it comes back, I'm okay, or hey, I'm up, but I'm not running in as part of an ensemble, or nothing at all. Um, this is the main way of monitoring Zookeeper. Uh, in addition to monitoring Zookeeper that way, you can also use JMX metrics but as I mentioned before, they lie. So there's another four-letter command, MNTR. MNTR gives you a lot of, uh, I think that's new in 3.3. Uh, that gives you a lot of different uh, data points that you can use to monitor solar. Everything from how many Z nodes do you have to how many watches, uh, the Zookeeper version. Um, we've, we had a problem about a year ago where it turned out that we had upgraded a version of, of uh, Zookeeper somewhere, and that up, just one node didn't get bounced uh, to pick up that new version. This, this caused uh, basically timing issues between nodes. Uh, once we discovered that, we were like, OK, we're going to add monitoring for that so that that never happens again. Uh, and we created a little tool called Versionator that does that. And also, just like Solar, Zookeeper also has the sense of a leader. So we want to make sure that we've identified the leader, understand where it is and what it's doing. Back to metrics and logs. We use these to understand what is the state of Zookeeper, um, how is it performing, and whatnot. Um, and finally, there's one last four-letter command that's worth pointing out. Um, we do this for tracking, not for really analysis. Um, but it's cons, which shows you the connection status. And it's also, I don't know if you guys heard about a month ago, Zookeeper 3.5 uh, was finally released. Uh, <laughs> the nice thing about this is it allows for dynamic reconfiguration of your Zookeeper ensemble, which is incredibly important. Um, once, you give, once you start up a process that relies on Zookeeper, um, it's kind of assumed that that ensemble will never, ever change. Uh, this makes it very difficult from an operational perspective to kind of orchestrate around that. Um, the other nice thing is that they now have these four-letter commands available from a Jetty REST endpoint. So no more you know, uh, using NC or uh, direct connections to, the, to these things. Um, all right, so let's talk about how we visualize solar. Um, I kind of want to give you a history a bit, um, see where we came from, and, and kind of like also a little bit of where we're going. 
So what you see here is, part, is a screen capture from a Bloomberg terminal. I apologize, it's a little funny, um, or fuzzy, I should say. Uh, it's fuzzy because those are some of our server names and we, have to, we protect them, so I blurred them out a little bit. Um, you might see that through a couple of slides. My apologies, kind of necessary. Um, so getting back to this. This, is, this was our initial version. It showed a single cloud view, and it showed you um, across different environments, in this case, our dev, alpha, and prod, and it was a snapshot in time. This was very useful for us to just say, hey, something is, someone is saying that there's a problem with this. Um, let us go look and see what we can figure out. Um, is this in a degraded state? Is everything okay? Really kind of crummy. Um, very, it's a very, very limited view, um, and for, as a service provider, not very useful. So we're like, okay, let's imagine how this would look if we were gonna do this across multiple clouds. So we have a new one, also built into the terminal. This was gonna display all the different clouds. We we're going to be do really cool things like sort them by status so the, the really bad ones are at the top and, and we can kind of address those in order of importance. Um, we're gonna be able to switch between environments so that you can see like, let me see all my prod clusters, let me see all my dev clusters, alpha clusters, whatnot. Um, you can do various commands. You can do, uh, hey, I'm gonna stop this node, I'm gonna restart this rack. I'm going to like operate at a, at a scale so that we can kind of orchestrate big changes. Um, this was a big improvement from us, for us from a workflow perspective, but it still wasn't quite right. Um, at still point in time, um, I had mentioned earlier that we have hundreds, I think it's actually thousands now, of different uh, solar applications that we monitor. Um, this doesn't scale that way. <laughs> um, we, this, I think, was fine when we had a couple, we had like 100 or two. Uh, after that, it kind of broke. Oops, sorry. So we created something called Night Owl. Night Owl uh, is the name of both a front-end and back-end service. Uh, the idea with Night Owl is that it was going to actively monitor solar uh, all the time. This is what our monitoring platform is built on today. Um, the idea behind it is that we viewed solar as, as kind of this tree structure. Um, we said, okay, what do we, um, what do we really need to monitor? Well, we need to understand uh, how the different leaf nodes act, how they, th how they operate up the tree, um, how one leaf node um, interacts with another. And we'll talk about some of the specifics around that later. Um, but this, this gave us a really good view. This is like, hey, this is a fairly scalable way of seeing exactly um, how our infrastructure was doing. But it was still limited. This was, our, this was the, uh, the service provider view. This is our view. We couldn't give this to tenants because it didn't provide them any value. All they would see is like, hey, is there a major widespread problem or is it just my problem? They didn't really care if it was a widespread problem. They just cared that they had a problem and this didn't come close to doing it for us. So I apologize. Every time I shake my hand, the slide changes. Ah. I'll put the mouse down so I don't do that anymore. <laughs> so we, we created Watchtower. Um, the idea behind Watchtower is that, hey, we're gonna let the service providers and our clients see the same view. They were gonna be able to see what we could see, with some exceptions. Um, we were going to be able to control everything from this. Our, our processes were gonna be built to this. Um, we could uh, integrate our, two, our second day things like, hey, we wanna do a schema change. We can do it through here. Um, you wanna be able to monitor metrics. You can do it here. You can configure your security policies. Everything can be done in this one view. This was a major improvement from what we were doing before. Um, it allowed us, as well as our tenants, to really introspect their systems. Um, but, so, sorry. Let me bring this over here. Um, it also allowed us to configure our alarming and, and do a little bit of uh, interesting analysis. So every time our monitoring software produced an event, we would then log it. We would then be able to display all these events as a cumulative view to our users. So we can integrate things like, 
this user st uh, stopped this process. This user um, created this uh, schema job. Um, this c cloud had an out-of-memory exception. Um, this cloud went into recovery. And we can kind of visualize and capture all of those events in one UI. Um, once we had this, we were able to slice and dice a little bit. So one of the big things that we found through being able to store this information and, and, and visualize and, and perform analytics on this is that we found out that over the course of a night, one of our bigger tenants would go into recovery hundreds or thousands of times. Um, this didn't create any alarms. It was just one node going down and coming back up a, a few minutes later. But we, what we looked at is, hey, why is this happening? Really understanding like, what, is, what, is the, what is the problem that's causing this to occur? And when we dug into it, it was all just, just GC issues. A node would go into GC, 15 seconds later it would pop back, reconnect to Zookeeper, and it was happy. Um, we did some analysis, we spent about a month on it, and we found out, hey, uh, CMS was causing the problem, we switched to G1 GC, and all of a sudden, that went away. That flutter that was overnight stopped happening. Um, and then when we did that throughout all of our infrastructure, everything immediately became more stable. And we've been able to do that for a few different iterations. That's just one uh, uh, fairly major case where um, this analysis has allowed us to uh, find problems that were systemic throughout our, our, our system and then make, the, make changes to address those. This view also allowed us to slice and dice the data in a different way. It let us look at things like, hey, is there a host that's bad? Um, is there a network segment that's having problems? Is there um, a particular security policy? Is there a particular tenant? Uh, is there a particular anything that, w that we can identify as causing issues? Um, this ability to like kind of um, introspect the data in different ways has let us really enjoy um, our monitoring and orchestration frameworks. It's prevented us from uh, actually having outages because we can, we can see patterns and trends that otherwise wouldn't be visible. But it's still not right. Our tenants really don't like it. So we've decided that we're gonna create one more view. Uh, and this is the last one, I'm sure it's the last one. We're never gonna create another UI after this. Um, we're also working with other service providers in our area um, who also have their own UIs. What, you know, we believe in the open source model in our group, other teams as well do. Um, why can't our Cassandra uh, uh, service provider also share the same UI that Solar does? Um, so that's one of the things that we're looking to accomplish here. Obviously, we're still early in the wireframe stages, um, but it's also going to be geared towards our tenants themselves. It's what they want to see. So what they're focused on is, is everything up? How do I connect? And what are my metrics? They don't care about the other stuff that we, we had put in. Um, so we're working closely with them to figure out, okay, um, what do they care about? What do they want? And we're gonna try and deliver that for them. All right, so getting back to our, our monitoring. There's something uh, that we created that I think is really making a big difference. So we created a chatbot in Slack uh, called BFSBot. The idea of it is, hey, you get woken up in the middle of the night. Um, how do you react? How, can you identify how bad a problem is? Can you identify what the problem is? Um, and it's all with the goal of, hey, let me identify it, let me address it, and go back to sleep without ever leaving bed, without ever opening up a laptop. Um, and from a security perspective, we just want to make sure it was read-only. Um, Spotify did an interesting talk in here yesterday where they, uh, through a Slack pot, actually do like index rebuilds. Uh, I don't think we'll ever be there yet <laughs> just because affecting change through this kind of makes me a little uneasy um, should there ever be a security problem. So keeping it read-only makes, uh, makes me feel a little bit safer. So we can go and say, sup? Sup tells us everything that is currently in an integrated state. Uh, if it's not active, it's there. It also lets us say, how is this thing? And it'll tell us, in this case, uh, there was a Zookeeper instance that was down. It was down because we had a hard drive failure. Um, and we were able to say, yep, 
this is good, I'm going back to sleep. Um, and we've started adding more and more functionality to this over the, over the time. We also publicize every event that happens to a Slack channel. Every time something goes up or down, we monitor that and post it. Um, all along with the information about like, hey, did we create a ticket about this? Is thing, are things getting better? Are things getting worse? Um, you know, it's one thing to wake up in the morning and see five events in the Slack channel. It's another thing to wake up in the middle in the morning and see 5,000 events. And you can just quantify like, hey, there are a lot of changes going on. Um, I need to get involved. I need to understand what's, going, what's happening here. All right. So let's walk through a, a couple different scenarios. So assuming you have a, a solar cloud with one collection, uh, for simplicity, this collection has two shards. Each shard has six replicas. Um, well, for us, we kind of go with the uh, whole um, cattle, not pets theory. So when we go and we lose one, we don't really care. Um, this is just normal operations. This happens all the time. Should we lose two? Well, maybe there's something that we want to know about. Um, should we lose three? Still don't really care. Um, we've notified someone that there's a problem. We've lost one in another shard. That other shard is in, is in just as degraded state as shard one. Um, so this is where we come back to being cloud aware. Understanding that solar is kind of a tr the status of solar can be represented by a tree, um, and understand that there's no ri operational risk at this point by having that other node be down. Losing another node, still not a problem. Uh, we've created a ticket. Someone will look at it. Someone will figure out what's going on. But then we lose that third node, and it sounds like well, half of a shard is down. Someone's got to wake up and fix this. Um, the thing that I want to point out that's really important here is that a lot of our monitoring is meant to uh, get us up, get us looking at problems way before our users even notice that an issue happened. At this point, even for shard one, you're still indexing, you're still querying. Um, you, know, you might have these six uh, nodes spread out across multiple avail availability zones. At this point, you might still be DR minus um, one. In our case, this is a scenario where um, you know, we might have lost a data center. OK, we're still serving traffic, but we have to get in and get involved and deal with it. So let's take a, a look at a different scenario. Leadership, I mentioned, was very important, right? Well, what happens if you actually lose your leader? Um, there are many reasons that you might do this. Uh, one of them is that machine goes down, you have an out-of-memory issue, network connectivity, any kind of thing that could have happened. So as soon as that happens, we start a clock. And we say, well, we're going to give Zookeeper and Solar 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever, to go and find a new leader. If that doesn't happen, we're going to create a ticket. And then we're going to start another clock and say, well, we're going to give it a little bit longer. And if it still doesn't happen, we're going to wake someone up. Um, this is kind of like having different degrees of problems um, and, and using timers to kind of figure out, like, hey, um, 5, 10 seconds is fine. 30 seconds, we might have a problem that we need to look at. All right. So what does this all look like from an infrastructure perspective? Well, as I mentioned before, we have a ton of Solar and Zookeeper instances that we're monitoring. Um, all of that is talking to Night Owl and monitors Night Owl, and Night Owl is doing all the monitoring. We write all of this to a status event solar instance. Um, taking that away for a minute, we then have all of our alarms and all of our rules built into this one service. When something happens, that service calls out to the Bloomberg's alarming framework, uh, a, a service that we don't own or control that just says, hey, this is a ticket, someone should look into this. Hey, this is a ticket, um, someone needs to be woken up. And, and they take care of the rest. Um, it doesn't matter what framework this is, we could be using PagerDuty for this, we could be using anything. Um, so what happens when we start adding a whole lot more Solar and Zookeeper instances? This doesn't exactly scale. So we had to kind of address that. And the first way is we took Kafka, and we kind of broke up uh, the monitoring part from the alarming part. And we use Kafka as kind of the intermediary between the two. So we've separated out our rules engine from the actual monitoring. 
Um, this allows us to make changes on the rules side a little bit easier, uh, making sure that our alarming configurations are, can be a lot more flexible. Um, it also allows us to have other event publishers say, hey, this is a monitoring event that I want to care about. It, effect, it might affect my solar instance. Uh, this could be anything from one of our tenants saying, hey, there's a problem, or it could be, um, hey, there's this uh, network information that we might care about. And all of that can go into our alarming, uh, into our rules engine to determine, like, should, should we handle this? Is there, something that we need to, uh, is there something that we need to act on? The flip side of that, is now our, our tenants can have uh, consumers of that Kafka queue. And they can say, hey, um, you guys have your own alarms. That's great. I want to integrate your alarms and your, and your um, events into my own alarming system. So I can say, I can track this myself. I can alarm on it for my own team if I care, if I care to. And bringing back that status events. Um, that, all that stuff, including the event publishers, gets written to that same uh, status, event, status events service. But you still notice, we still have that one big monitoring block. Um, that's not a scalable solution. That's not going to work forever. Um, so we've broken that up, and now we're running that bit in, in Kubernetes. So different, uh, each one of those is a single monitoring service, similar to the way it was before. Except now it said, OK, when you start up, you're told uh, what, you're what segment you're supposed to monitor. Um, maybe it's a specific tenancy. Maybe it's a group of indivi individual services, whatever. Um, at startup, you're told exactly who you're supposed to monitor. Um, should you die, someone will replace you and do exactly the same thing. Since doing this, we've also been able to do things like use that same framework to monitor our admin services and our kube services. So this has proved we can apply the same exact uh, algorithms and design for monitoring everything that we, all the pieces of infrastructure that we have. So what's next? So we had this great goal of uh, creating a, a really dynamic rule configuration engine at, uh, for 2019. Uh, we were hoping to leverage some of the Kafka stream stuff that we learned about last year, um, maybe even Flink to figure out how to make that a really powerful uh, uh, alarming engine. Uh, that work is ongoing, but it, it's still not there yet. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, once we got into the weeds of this, we realized that it's actually a very complicated problem that we're, that we're trying to solve. Um, so hopefully, we'll have news on that. We want to also open source Night Owl. Now that we've kind of broken out all the um, alarming from it, and it's just the monitoring piece, it's a lot easier to then go and say, OK, we're going to open source this. Uh, this actually has value to the, the community. Um, but what we realized is that it's still tightly integrated into the Bloomberg architecture. Um, so hopefully for next year, we'll be able to detangle some of that and then uh, release that and make that usable for other people. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, any questions? I'm just uh, wondering what your take is on Prometheus and that side of things. Uh, I think Prometheus is great, um, especially with some of the work that was done in Solar 7 to make you know, Prometheus exporters and uh, metrics greatly improved over Solar 4, 5, and 6. Um, we love what we've done. We, we love what's been done. Uh, and one of the contributions that we made just a few months ago is we rebuilt the Solar Metrics Collector because it just wasn't doing it. There were a lot of bugs in it. So we kind of built that from, rebuilt that from scratch and published it. Um, and that, I'm sure, is available now. And we're running that for a number of our Solar 7 collections. Um, we're just starting to experiment with Solar 8. So hopefully that Prometheus will help with our experimentation of that. Um, but yeah, I, I love Prometheus. Uh oh. <laughs> um, great talk, thank you. Um, you mentioned that like when servers start going down and you you have Slack alerts for every single state change, um, at the scale that you're operating at, 
if you're dealing with individual servers, um, somebody once told me like, you've already lost. So what's, what's your take on that? Like, why is that valuable? I don't understand that. That's, that's a great question. Um, so there, there's a few parts, so let me try and address it, and then you tell me if I, if I answered your question. So the first part is, uh, if you're dealing with a single server, you, you've, already, you've just missed the boat. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things that we will routine, routinely do is say, um, we're going to upgrade the firmware on the router on a rack, and we'll just shut the whole rack down. And at this point, we don't care one bit, because when we, pl when we place our services throughout our infrastructure, um, we have some idea of like, hey, let's not put two of the same services in the same rack. Um, let's make sure that, you know, let me rephrase. Let let's not put two replicas in the same rack. Um, so that as we're running these things, you know, you lose a server, you lose a rack, uh, you don't really care. In fact, most of our infrastructure is built so that we could lose an entire data center and still not really care. Uh, that's not to say that I don't want an alert saying that this happened. Um, you know, hey, we, we've seen issues where um, a server is just behaving badly. Um, we had a, a hard drive go bad uh, about six months ago. No alarms. Our SREs didn't notice anything. There were no individual metrics that would have indicated that there was a problem. But when you look at the queue times for that one instance on solar, um, those queue times were exploding compared to the same query on other instances. So we also found out that it was also going into recovery now and again, and it was just acting flaky. So while we don't really care about one server, we still want to be able to detect that there's a problem and, and kind of deal with that. Um, and as far as how, the, how that all integrates in Slack, um, sometimes it's, hey, there was a problem with the server. Um, you know, I want to be able to uh, issue the how is foo command, and then just be able to monitor that Slack channel and say, yep, nodes are coming back up. How is, yep, everything's 100% active. I'm good. I can go back to sleep. So it's more of a way to get that, that feedback of what's going on uh, from a remote, remote location instead of having to open up your, your laptop, log in. Uh, I feel like that's really the difference between can I go back to sleep or am I then going to be up for the next two hours? Once I decide I have to get up, wake my son, wake my wife up in the process, um, you know, it's just a bad sign. Where if I can look at things and say, yep, we lost a leader. Um, it came back a minute and a half later. Um, there's another replica that's down, but overall my system is in a good state and it's getting better. I'm happy. Did that answer your question? Two thumbs up. Cool. Any other questions? Just maybe a more light question. Uh, do you know how SREs are happy now? Like, did you kind of follow up how this thing like evolved? What what time did you save? What is like? Do you follow up uh, SRE fatigue? Like, yep. An input on there. So it's it's interesting. We have a SRE team that was that grew out of uh, the search infrastructure team. We were originally one team, and then they they separated off and now do um, SRE providing, they provide SRE services for uh, relational databases, Cassandra, our data science platform, Hadoop, HBase, a, a bunch of different technologies. Um, but they also remember where they came from. So we have a really close working relationship with them. With that, it's like, hey, can you guys look into this? There's something wrong, or, or um, they'll mention something to us, say, we've gotten this alert, um, anything going on. They're as familiar with our tools as we are. Um, they've also put, had a lot of input into how they're created so that um, as we're releasing new features, they have input into what those features look like uh, and it matches up with their workflows. Uh, in fact, a lot of what we're doing in our, in our next version of the UI is building in tools so that they can say, take this host and put it in maintenance mode. And that integrates with their own uh, services that say, yep, this host is going to be in maintenance mode. Uh, I'm going to stop all the services on it. I'm going to log it at its maintenance. I'm going to let our users know that this host is in maintenance. Our monitoring is going to be aware of that. So it's, go it's going to be, um, it's going to be uh, more tolerant of that node being down. So if, um, how that plays out is, so for example, we have a generic query UI. 
Um, and one of the things that we found is by building that generic query UI, um, people were able to execute production queries that were, that were never tested and could do really, really bad things. Well, so we said, okay, you can run that query as long as your entire cluster is active. You bring down a node, no big deal, it'll come back up, we'll deal with it then. Nobody's gonna get woken up in the middle of the night, cool. Well, what happens when that node is down for maintenance? Um, sorry, the one thing I forgot to say is, uh, once that node is down, we, we block the user from doing any further queries, because it's like, hey, what you did might have caused a node to be down. Um, so when a node com is out for maintenance, we have to be able to detect and distinguish between those two things so that a user can still query even though that, that host is down for a completely unrelated issue. Thanks for this great presentation. Thanks, everyone.